Hello and welcome to the lecture for part one of chapter 25. In this lecture, I'll talk about differential analysis, which is how we can provide information as accountants to make decisions in a business. This is really kind of a fascinating part of the of the uh, of the course. And then in the next part of the of this lecture, which I'll record tomorrow, uh, I'll talk about activity based costing, which is something I really think is pretty cool. So. Uh, you're forewarned I'm likely to get excited about that topic. So differential analysis, some people call it incremental analysis, uh, involves using accounting information to choose between two different alternatives. A couple of caveats, um, sunk costs, so that's money that you've already spent on something, a decision that's already been made and it can't be recouped, it's not relevant for future decisions. So the fact that you bought a specialized machine six months ago that you can't sell and can't do anything with, that's not a basis for deciding what type of business to do in the future, okay? So it's sunk, it can't be changed regardless of which path you take going forward. And then a very key factor here is you only examine the revenues and costs that will change. So if you're looking at two different scenarios, you don't have to look at the entire company under both scenarios. You only have to look at what is going to be different under the two different scenarios. So you kind of weed things out. The book kind of um, contradicts that a little bit in a couple of their examples. I'll point that out as we go. So the process for doing a differential analysis is the following. So first you identify the objective of the decision. In most businesses, the objective of a decision is what will increase net income? What will improve our bottom line? And then once you do that, you identify different courses of action. In, in this, uh, the book just describes usually uh, option A or option B, two different choices, but of course it could be six different choices. It could be a variety of different things. It doesn't, uh, doesn't really change anything that we're gonna look at. So once you identify the different courses of action, you gather as much information as you can and you perform a differential analysis, which we'll go through a couple of examples of that. That leads to a decision that's made, and then this is very important, and a lot of people uh, skip this step, is, is to review and analyze the result of the decision after the fact. And so the purpose of that is to say, were my assumptions correct? The information that I gathered, did that hold true in reality? Uh, and it'll, it'll cause you to be better about making these kinds of decisions going forward. So a couple of complexities that are not addressed in this, um, in this chapter that would be addressed in a higher level course uh, would be one, one consequence might be investment income that you earn for cash saved by not doing a particular course of action. Another would be state uh, and federal tax implications for the decisions. Another would be the opportunity cost. So those are benefits that are foregone or missed by not taking a particular decision. Uh, and then secondary impacts. So uh, how might uh, choosing uh, option A over option B affect other seemingly unrelated parts of the business? So it can, it can get more complex than what we're talking about here is the long and the short of it. So some common types of decisions that are made using this uh, is to either uh, lease or sell equipment. So I have an extra building on my property. Uh, should I rent it out to somebody or should I just sell it? Now that works in reverse too. So uh, a copy machine for my business. Am I better off leasing it, renting it in effect, or am I better off buying it and owning it? Uh, if any of you have ever leased a car, you've had that decision. Should I buy it outright or should I uh, pay a monthly amount and give the car back at the end of the lease. So we'll talk about that. We'll talk about whether or not to discontinue an unprofitable product line, or it could be a whole segment of the business. So I was in a company once where we discontinued an unprofitable product line. Our revenue went down and our profits went up. So uh, a lot of times it can be counterintuitive. Whether or not we'll make or buy a part, that's something that every manufacturer deals with continuously. So there are some things that make sense to buy from other suppliers and there are other things that make sense to do yourself. 
we'll talk about whether or not to replace a fixed asset, like say a company truck that's got 300,000 miles on it. At what point are you better off getting a new truck versus continuing to fix the old one? We'll talk about selling a product or processing it further uh, and then accepting a special offer. So you normally sell something at $10 and a customer comes and says, I'll buy a whole bunch if you can sell it to me for $8, should you take the offer or not? So a lot of times these decisions in, in companies become the subject of heated arguments. Uh, you know, people have different vested interests and sometimes benefit personally from a decision being one way or the other. Obviously, if you're in charge of a product line and, and we're debating whether or not the product line should be discontinued, you might argue really strongly against that because it affects you personally. So it's important to make sure in these kinds of situations that you have been as transparent and as clear in the facts that you've gathered as possible. Uh, and, and don't get pulled into the emotional aspects of the, uh, of the argument. So the first one I wanna talk about is lease or sell. So in this case here, uh, we have equipment that costs $200,000. It has $120,000 in accumulated appreciation. So it has a book value of $80,000. So one alternative is to lease it uh, out for $160,000, but we'll have to maintain it. So we have to repair insurance and property taxes. It's still our property for $35,000 or we could sell it for $100,000 and pay a 6% commission. Again, the $80,000 of book value, that's a sunk cost. We already bought the equipment, it's on our books, so it's, it's gonna be there regardless. Either it's going to offset the gain we get on the sale price, or we're gonna have depreciation on it. So it's gonna hit our financial statement one way or the other. So in this case here, if we lease the equipment, we get $160,000 in revenues, 35,000 in costs. So the net effect is income of 125,000. Now, of course, that would be uh, offset by the depreciation, but again, that's a sunk cost, so we don't need to consider it. Or we could sell the equipment for $100,000 minus the 6% commission of 6,000 and have 94,000 left over. As you can see in the third column, the differential effect, we're $31,000 better off by leasing the equipment out than by selling it. So that's a, it's fairly simple and fairly intuitive, but seeing it like this, it presents it very clearly. Here's the consequence of alternative one, consequence of alternative two. We're only looking at the things that are different between those two alternatives. Next, we'll look at whether or not to can discontinue a product line or a segment. So this company's got three different kinds of um, products that it has, corn flakes, toasted flakes, and bran flakes. And you can see the overall company has sales of a million and is profitable to the tune of $69,000. Uh, but if we look at the bran flakes uh, product line, it's, it's unprofitable. So one of the problems with that is what we're looking at is a traditional income statement. So if we converted it to a contribution margin income statement, we'd see that brand flakes uh, with $100,000 in sales, 60,000 in variable costs and 25,000, uh, excuse me, variable cost of goods sold, 25,000 of variable operating expenses. So it's got 85,000 of variable costs. So it produces 15,000 of contribution margin, which helps the company. So the primary reason for the loss is the allocation of fixed costs that don't go away if we get rid of the product line. So we can look at that as follows. So option one is we continue to keep brand flakes in the mix and we get $100,000 and we have variable costs and fixed costs. So we have an $11,000 loss. And then we dis the other options, we discontinue brand flakes. So in that case, we get no revenue, we get no variable costs because there's no variable costs if there's no product being sold. And then we have fixed costs of 26,000. So you can see there we're $15,000 worse off by discontinuing the brand flakes product line. And as I mentioned a minute ago in the last slide, what was the contribution margin for brand flakes? It was $15,000. So we're worse off by missing out on earning that contribution margin. So if fixed costs are truly unavoidable and can't be um, voided or, or, or um, dismissed, 
then if it if a product line has positive contribution margin we're better off by keeping it than getting rid of it the next one i want to talk about is make or buy so a part is currently being purchased for 240 dollars a unit we have excess factory capacity that's an important element and we've got information there on uh, direct materials, direct labor, variable factory overhead, and then fixed factory overhead. And again, remember that fixed factory overhead is going to be there whether we buy this part or make it ourselves, regardless. So I can look at the two alternatives here. What if I make the panel myself? What if I buy it? So if I make the panel itself, I don't have a purchase price, but I have direct materials. See, it's a negative number because it's a cash outflow. I have direct labor, I have variable factory overhead, and I have fixed factory overhead. So the net cost is $280. If I buy the panel, I pay $240 for it, but I still have that fixed factory overhead of 68. So $308 is the total all-in cost of buying the panel. So in this case, I'm better off making them myself by $28. Now, there might be other considerations when I dealt with this in my factory. Um, I found that in many cases we had better control over quality if we made parts ourselves. So there's other secondary considerations beyond just the financial. But here's how we would analyze the financial impact of a decision. So the next is replacing a piece of equipment. So. In, the, in this case, we have an old machine with a book value of $100,000. It costs $225,000 in variable costs to uh, run annually. Uh, we could sell it for $25,000 if we were going to sell it as a used piece of machinery, and it's got five years uh, left of life. Or I could buy a brand new machine and spend $250,000. Because it's a new machine, it requires less maintenance. So my annual variable manufacturing costs are lower because I'm not maintaining. It might be a more productive machine as well. Uh, no residual value and it's estimated to, to last five years as well. So let's take a look at the comparison here. So if I continue with the old machine, I will get no proceeds from selling it, that's zero. And I also won't have to buy a new machine, that's zero. And I'll have those variable manufacturing costs over five years. So the figure that was shown was an annual amount. So we're going to look at it for the full five year life. So a million one twenty five. Now, if I replace the old machine, I'm going to get twenty five thousand dollars for selling it. I'm going to spend two hundred and fifty thousand on the new machine. And then I will have seven hundred and fifty thousand of variable manufacturing cost over the five year period. Because again, it's $150,000 per year of manufacturing cost. So in that case, I have a net outlay of $975,000. So by replacing the old machine, the impact on the company is we're going to be better off by $150,000. So I think you can see this would be a very relevant way to lay out the information required to make a significant decision about outlaying that kind of money. The next one is whether or not we should process something uh, further, add cost to it to sell it at a higher price, or sell it as is at that juncture. Uh, I used to be in charge of a sawmill, and we would talk often about whether or not we should sell scrap as rough lumber or if we should plane it so it could be sold as surfaced lumber. Uh, and in that case, we looked at the additional cost of planing it versus the additional amount that we could get if we sold it. This, this is dealing with kerosene, which could be further refined into gasoline. So in this case, we have a $4,000 batch. The cost of producing kerosene is $2,400 and the selling price is $2.50 per gallon. Now, if we process it further into gasoline, there's some evaporation that takes place. So that 4,000 gallons becomes 3,200 gallons. And there's some cost of producing that, okay? And then there, the selling price is higher for gasoline than kerosene. So again, we'll set it up the same way. Option A, option B, or in this case, alternative one, alternative two. So if we sell it as kerosene, we get $10,000 and the costs are 2,400. 
If we process it further into gasoline, our revenues go up a little bit, even though it's a lower volume, and our costs are a little bit higher because we're processing it further. So the net impact of selling it in an intermediate stage as kerosene is $7,600. If we process it further to gasoline, we're better off by $550. So again, if it was the opposite, if we were worse off by processing it further, maybe the cost or the price of the gasoline is lower or something like that, uh, then we would make the decision, the rational decision, better to just sell it as kerosene than to incur further cost. The last one I wanna talk about is one that comes up all the time. And this is whether or not to accept business at a special price. One thing I would have to say that kind of is uh, an assumption that runs through this particular example is it's critical that accepting uh, an order at a special price that your existing customers not find out about that, which is kind of a funny thing to say. Um, but obviously if you're selling basketballs at, um, Let's see, eight, uh, twenty dollars each, I think, is the total. And if you get an offer to buy to sell them at eighteen dollars each, you don't want all of your customers to find out that you're actually selling them at eighteen at a lower price because they'll want that same price. So, uh, in this case, we've got some information there about variable costs and fixed costs. And you can see here, if we reject the order, we get no revenue and we have no cost. If we accept the order. Then we'll have $90,000 in revenue, $62,500 in cost. So we'll be better off by $27,500 by accepting that order. Even though it's less than what our total cost is, it's not less than the selling price isn't less than our variable cost. So as long as we can sell something at more than our variable cost and we have capacity, we'll be better off financially as a company. Again, it's, ex it's assuming that accepting this offer won't affect your existing market. So that is the end of this presentation. Uh, I hope you found that helpful. I would recommend as you're doing the homework, which involves a lot of these different types of analysis, that you look back at either the PowerPoint or this lecture. And I will talk to you again uh, when we cover part two of this, which is activity-based costing. Thank you.